How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Saturdays, 1 p.m. with Jim Valley. And Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern with me. I'm back live on the air. We were two weeks. Uh, we had a little bit of an issue connecting last week, obviously. Everybody, the whole pro wrestling world that's interested in AEW was in Las Vegas. I was there. I had to cut my trip short. I had a little family emergency. Everything is fine. No issues here. But I had to cut my trip a little short. Uh, I did not make it to the pay-per-view. I left Sunday morning. Can you believe that? I went all the way to Las Vegas, missed the pay-per-view. But you know what? It, it all worked out in the end. And I know a lot of people had a great time there. It was a really good pay-per-view. We're going to talk about that, obviously, a little bit. I'm going to be joined by Will Washington, Grap City Podcast, one of my favorite people on the internet at this point. One of my top people on the internet. He's going to be joining us to talk about everything happening in pro wrestling. But, I mean, this news the last couple days, not a lot of positive. CM Punk injured. Obviously, we know Jeff Hardy's injured. Cody Rhodes, torn, possible torn peck. Not an not a, not a easy injury to come from. We're hearing uh, Brian Danielson may be injured. And there's a couple other ones. Uh, this is, uh, you know, things are getting heated. Things are getting hot. People, uh, the work rate has improved tremendously in professional wrestling. And these things are happening. Uh, well, I want to talk to Will about, you know, why so many injuries now it could be a coincidence. You know, I will had a post actually saying like in 2007, there were, uh, it was just one after another every month. Uh, I think he said Mysterio and uh, a whole bunch of other people. So I want to talk to him about that because this is a fascinating period in professional wrestling. Obviously, like I said, CM Punk injured AEW title picture is a disaster right now. A lot of confusion. I watched dynamite a little delayed, right? So uh, I want to talk to Will about that because there were a couple spots in that punk match. I was like, oh, wow, I wonder if he got hurt. And obviously, uh, we find out on Friday that he did get hurt, which is causing a lot of issues here. But, you know, when we look at this, the big picture, I don't I don't know what direction they should go in. A lot of people saying, you know, maybe this isn't the direction. I think it's fine. They're doing an interim title is really cool. We're going to talk about this and a whole lot of other stuff. Also, Hell in a Cell preview happening tonight will washington joining me wrestling observer live andrew zarian here we'll be right back here on sports byline usa wrestling observer live andrew zarian here joined by will washington grap city podcast what's going on will hey it's sunday and uh i don't know i'm just having Quite the first Sunday of, I guess, my kid's summer break. Like, as soon as we're done here, I got to go uh, spark up the grill, and we're supposed to be cooking chicken wings and all that. It's going to be a good time. That was uh, that was me yesterday. I did the whole barbecue thing with the kids. My, my summer vacation has not begun with my kids. I got another uh, two more weeks till that starts. I'm yeah. looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, we were we were in Vegas together last week. We did a show together. We did, we're live pal with Garrett. I had a blast having you on. And it's always a blast having you on anything we do. But I was like, you know what? Let me let me message Will. Let me see if he wants to come on. Very last minute, but I appreciate you coming on. Uh, a lot going on in pro wrestling, man. Uh, the aftermath of this past week has kind of trickled into long term issues. I guess we'll start off with CM Punk and the the confusing title picture for AEW. Uh, I, I like I said, I didn't watch it. I, I I didn't watch him get hurt live, but I was watching it, and I thought you know maybe something was going on. He was a little wobbly in certain points. And then on Friday, he came out and pretty much said he's hurt. Uh, Tony wouldn't let him relinquish the title. We also find out that now there is an interim title uh, situation happening. What do you make of all this? Uh, you know, I am i don't hate interim titles the way a lot of people do. Same here. Uh, mainly because I, uh, I like that it holds... Uh, it holds booking accountable in a sense because now we know when CM Punk returns, he's going to have to. Uh, we're going to have to settle the undisputed title situation. I like that because the thing I hate more than anything else is when somebody relinquishes a title, returns, and never comes back for it. That annoys me, and I feel like uh, interim titles hold them accountable. Only thing I don't like about the interim title situation is that, at least for as far as <coughs> excuse me, as far as AEW is concerned. Uh, they've never counted those interim reigns toward the lineal championship reign. And so oh, whoever wins it here, are they just not going to be counted as a champion? I hope not. I hope that's not the case. Is that what uh, they have, and... what they've done with, uh, with Cody with well, when he, when well, like the school, title situation happened? 
If you look at AEW's actual championship lineage uh, for the TNT title, Sammy's reign isn't officially counted as having begun until after he beat Cody for the undisputed belt. So those other days like don't count. And so that's where I feel like they have to have kind of a situation to address that. I hope because the thing I would hate to see happen is like if Moxley wins the title and then he's not considered an actual two-time champion unless he beats CM Punk officially. I don't like that. But other than that, I do like the idea that CM Punk is guaranteed to compete for the title the moment he returns. Yeah, I kind of like that, too. I, I think the biggest uh, confusion and, I guess, uh, disaster piece to this is the Forbidden Door pay-per-view because they had to make that make sense. On Wednesday, they announced Tanahashi. Uh, you know, he came out, got a big pop. They People are ready for that Tanah- Tanahashi match. And you still have to now incorporate those two in that Forbidden Door pay-per-view. I, I There's a lot of argument to, you know, why is it John Moxley, you know, the... Technically, Hangman should have his rematch. There's a couple other people that should be in this mix. I don't know. I, I don't. I, I'm not. I don't feel as strongly for it or against it as much as other people do. I think it'll play out and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But do you think that you know maybe Hangman should have been involved in this position instead of Moxley? I, I don't know. I mean, I I get why people uh, saw kind of a, a sleight of hand here because. The rankings were last put out before last week's Dynamite. Yeah. And so the last time we had seen the rankings officially was, uh, had Wardlow actually as the number one contender. Um, and then they said Moxley's the number one contender. But, and I recognize, you know, Tony even explained himself that the reason for that was because Moxley won in the main event of Dynamite this week, making him number one contender again. But those rankings hadn't been put out yet. So immediately people cried foul on all of that. And uh, and then, of course, they put out updated rankings and people were like, oh, you just changed it for uh, because of the announcement. And then and Tony Khan had to go through this whole explanation on Twitter. Uh, I feel like it wasn't as complicated as AEW made it out to be. Uh, and shout out to uh, I think his name was Jelly Janella on Twitter who decided to put together a bracket to show exactly how this is going to work. It's a simple, it's simple bracket. bracket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when you see it in bracket form, <laughs> makes perfect sense, right? It just says winner of Battle Royal, John Moxley, on one side of the bracket. On the other side, it says uh, Dominion, it says Roshi Tanahashi and Goto. And then the winner of those two face each other at Forbidden Door. When you see it in a bracket, makes perfect sense. <laughs> makes t- uh, I think Jericho's but- <laughs> commentary also kind of uh, mixed it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So that Battle Royal is kicking off Dynamite on Wednesday. Like you said, the winner's going to face John Moxley. Uh, and the winner of that match, which I think most likely it's going to be Moxley. Will go on to face Tanahashi at Forbidden Door, but Tanahashi has to face Goto at Dominion beforehand, right. which is next week, this coming week. So, man, you know, uh, I think it's pretty interesting. I think it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, I mean, the an injury is not cool. That that's that sucks for him, uh, considering the fact you know it's been so many years since he won a world title. He finally got it. Uh, this is AEW's leading into a. Very aggressive campaign for TV, obviously. The summer, going into the fall, going into the winter, they really, I mean, I think this is uh, this is pretty uh, common knowledge. They really want to get those ratings up prior to negotiating. And how do you do that? You do it by putting your title on someone that has a large name. Your TV program has to be, uh, programming for TV has to be really uh, aggressive. You can't have these lull periods on TV dynamite was out of control. I thought it was a fantastic dynamite. One of my favorite dynamites that I've watched in a very long time. Uh, I can't rank it. People are asking me, you know, on, on Thursday, can you rank the show on Friday? I should say, can you rank the show? I can't rank like where it falls, but I, I thought it was a tremendous show. And I would anticipate that a lot of the shows are going to be like this. They're going to be really good shows because a lot of stuff is on the line right now. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's terrible, but, they did a pretty good job at, at kind of fixing this. Uh, unfortunately, people got confused. What did you think of Rampage? I actually really liked Rampage. I, uh, you know, I, I've been a fan, and I've told Tony this personally, that I think that the live Rampages that aren't go-home shows to pay-per-views have been some of the best episodes of Rampage. And this wasn't an exception. This was live from the Toyota Arena Ontario, yeah. in Ontario. Yeah, and that one, uh, I just thought from top to bottom, they really 
You know, I, I feel like when they have to sell those standalone rampages, they really have to make people's money's worth. When you don't, when you're doing it as a go home show, it's like, yeah, they've got the pay per view to, uh, this weekend, so they don't have to do as much. But I feel like when it's just a standalone show, people have to get their money's worth. And I feel like that Ontario crowd got it with the Lucha Bros and Young Bucks. Uh, I thought Athena and Kiara Hogan was really good. Um, of course, they got the CM Punk promo and then uh, the TNT title match. Uh, I feel like it got cut short. I'm guessing that the punk promo wasn't originally planned for that show. Yeah. And that match only went like less than 10 minutes. And apparently Scorpio Sky's hurt too. So uh, he's supposed to be getting an MRI this week. And uh, it's just that the injury bug is like everywhere today. It's everywhere. And then you wonder why. Like why why so much at the same time? Uh, but you had an interesting post on Twitter. People should definitely follow you uh, on Twitter. You, you had this post that, you know, 2007 – was like back to back injuries as well. Yeah, and uh and it's funny. I, I actually remembered all of those uh, as I was going through. Very impressive. Uh, I was like, okay, <laughs> just going uh, top to well, I remember that year very vividly because so much had to happen. The thing I didn't mention in that post when I talked about all of those main event injuries, three of those guys were champions. They had to vacate world titles three times that year yeah. because of the fact that uh the champions kept getting injured, the top guys. And um, there wasn't really anything different being done that year. You know, I feel like John Cena was probably going harder than any champion had gone uh, previously. He was working every single house show. He was doing all of these big pay-per-view matches. But other than that, it didn't really feel like anything was all that different. But it just left and right. You had uh, Triple H getting hurt. Shawn Michaels got hurt. Undertaker got hurt. Edge got hurt. Uh, Rey Mysterio was already hurt going into the year. But then Cena got hurt. And just left and right, all of these top main event injuries kept happening. And the reason I brought that up uh, on Twitter was because we're kind of seeing left and right. We're seeing these top guys getting hurt. You know, the the Cody rumors out there right now. There's uh, Brian Danielson is out there. And now CM Punk uh, just this past Friday confirmed it. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see. I don't know if it anything is. particular is happening with it, but it's tough. We have a lot more to talk about. Going to a break right now. Wrestling Observer Live, Andrew Zarin here, joined by Will Washington on Sports Byline USA. We'll be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live, Andrew Zarin here, Sunday edition. Will Washington, Grap City Podcast, joining me. One of my favorite podcasts out there. I told Will how much I love his stuff. I told you in, I I told you in, in so Vegas. Much. I was like, dude, I love everything you do. It's fantastic. A uh, 17 year vet of podcasting. We have a lot, uh, la like, after the show we did last, a uh, couple of months ago when you were on, like, we spent, like, 45 minutes just, like, I can't believe that's how you got in also, you know? So, it's I love hearing stuff like that. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, something we were both uh, dealing with in Vegas was the MJF situation. Uh, it, it kind of... Uh, I, I don't want to dwell on it as, as much as everybody else has because it's old news by now but we're still kind of dealing with it and we don't have a direct answer but you know wednesday mjf cut a, the promo of his life uh i know a lot of people were not they didn't love that promo I, I could understand both sides but i personally i thought it was great i thought it was tremendous it was fantastic he did a great job uh he it, it was uh a modern day work shoot promo and i think it's been a while since we saw something like that especially on tv uh especially on the caliber of mjf to cut a promo like that so the story was obviously he no showed the fan fest. He worked a match on Sunday. It was another squash. One, two, three. He was stretchered out. He left. Uh, there was a meeting on Monday. Wednesday, he cut the promo of his life. And now we're we don't know where we're gonna be with this. Uh what do you think, Will? Um I don't know. Yeah, you know, I've I've talked to a lot of people as far as that's all concerned. And uh I've heard everything from it was a work all along, which uh, I struggle with that. I don't. Because, I don't subscribe uh, to that. Yeah, I don't subscribe. Uh, yeah, to that. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't either. Uh, and I say that simply because uh, for those who follow me, they know that uh, I, I had kind of given some conjecture on what I thought the thing was going to be or what I thought was going on um, based on people I had talked to in AEW, and then uh, I was corrected by people in AEW uh, to um, to make sure that what I had said wasn't true. And with that, I feel like there's no way that wouldn't have even been important. That was such a minor detail that I feel like had this all been a work, 
making sure I got that detail correct wouldn't have mattered. Um, yeah. Unless there, this is such a meticulous work that it's like almost like those choose your adventure type games where they're like, okay, if it goes this way, then make sure that we get these people correct. It wouldn't have made any sense. And so uh, based on the conversations I had, I don't believe it was always a work. Um, do I believe it's a work now? Probably. Uh, but, uh, or at least do I believe there's some kind of agreement in place to make agreement sure things place, are going? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, but it's fascinating TV, no matter what. It's very entertaining. Uh, and the, the promo, Again, it, you know, looking at it in a vacuum, I'm very entertained by this. It, it was the best promo that MJF has cut. It's one of the most entertaining things that's happened on TV. Um, but like I've said before, the pipe bomb was also very entertaining television and looked at it in a vacuum, one of the best promos of all time. Looked at it long term, it was just CM Punk bringing up a bunch of systemic stuff with WWE that literally never got fixed. Yeah. And so, like, did that actually go anywhere? Did that solve anything? Not really. Uh, and was it good for anybody involved besides CM Punk? Not really. So uh, I can kind of see the parallels with this particular promo as well. I mean, word for word parallels, right? I mean, he really, it, it, there was somebody put a video on Twitter and it was like word for word, the same exact uh, promo, which makes a lot of sense. And, you know, CM Punk came and chased them off afterwards, after his promo. So and that, by the way, was the first time people noticed CM Punk was limping. He like, was limping. Yeah, the way, he made his yeah. way out and uh, he definitely did not seem so to be he, chasing him with any type of purpose. Did he bust his foot when he jumped into the crowd? That's what I'm oh, hearing. And you know what? For his sake, I hope time. he didn't. I hope he didn't do that. I hope that wasn't. I it. was talking with another wrestler in AEW about this two days ago and we were both just kind of talking about the idea that god that sucks because it's one thing for it to happen in the ring shit happens in the ring um but uh the uh as far as uh you know something that was kind of in your control and not related to wrestling necessarily it's, it was just the entrance that on the other hand is something that nobody wants to see happen and it just kind of happened yeah yeah, uh, terrible all around. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to see what happens here with, with this uh, situation because listen, this is the good thing about pro wrestling, right? When, when you don't know uh, and you can't predict, it's, it's always fun. I, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in the predicting what's going to happen or trying to finagle an angle that, that, that's for their liking. But like when something like this happens, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think that adds a whole different level of excitement. Uh, NXT had a show yesterday. They did uh, in your house, uh, yeah. which, uh, you know, somebody had pointed out the they just put up the poster from last year's in your house and put it side by side with this year's. And one, how many people from last year's are like in AEW now? Yeah, um, it was kind of astonishing. But the, like this year, it is truly a whole new regime for that uh, for that entire brand. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I, I, you know, it's like, I watched the main event. I didn't watch all, the whole show, right? I watched, uh, Mandy Rose and, uh, Wendy Chu and I watched, I watched some of the Creed Brothers stuff and I watched the main event. Mm -hmm. uh, Braun Breaker is definitely the man, right? The, he's the guy. The, the, there's no, there's no question around, uh, there's no question around him being the guy that they're putting the prime focus on in that company. Uh, a hundred percent. I, I, I. I think he's going to be very successful if he goes on track the way it's going. But this is a very different NXT. This is a very different show. There's no similarity left to compare it to anything else prior to this. This is more in terms of what they had envisioned for the company instead of, you know, becoming uh, a, a, a hyped up version of Ring of Honor for a couple of years. But you could see that who, who they're putting the... Uh, you could see who they're putting the effort on, uh, on there, and it's obviously you know Joe Gacy's one, Braun Breaker's one, Mandy Rose, Creed Brothers. You know, who do you think is going to be the breakout out of this group of of NXT well, stars outside of Braun, obviously? Well, you know, it's funny that you said that because uh, the one person that I think it's going to be is actually the person who still kind of embodies the most of the old NXT. And that to me is Carmelo Hayes, right? Like Carmelo Hayes was an indie name that had a presence on the indies. He was Christian Casanova. Yeah. Um, he was signed not as part of the, the newer type of class of WWE wrestler, but he was signed uh, back when they were still kind of raiding the indies. And 
he kind of, as a matter of fact, he debuted on the old NXT, but he didn't really have much of a presence there until they rebranded the 2.0. But he still fits the formula of what old NXT is. But I also feel like he has the most upside of anybody I see there. Yeah, I, I, I feel that there's a couple of people here. But, you know, when they come to the main roster with this, and great example, um, Max Dupree, right? Eli Drake, uh, known guy, became LA Knight there. They changed his name again on the main roster. Uh, you could tell he's a main roster act. The guy's a great actor, great physique, great look. But they have taken away so much of it where you're not really seeing what he was able to do prior to any of this. Even in NXT, they they, they took away a lot of it. When a guy like Braun Breaker goes up to the main roster, do you think he's going to have that same issue? Uh, Ciampa's another one, right? Tommaso Ciampa's another guy that... When he was in NXT and he was at his peak and people would fantasize about him coming to their main roster, it was always in a main position, right? The story was, this guy is tremendous. People are so behind him. Johnny Gargano was another one. Uh, it was almost, maybe it was almost a blessing in disguise that those two had to go back down to NXT because I, I really don't have confidence that they are going to be able to present these guys that became that got these cult followings and became, you know, stars in NXT, present them in the same vision on the main roster. I, they all tend to lose something. Well, and I think now they are just kind of setting the precedent because, like, look at LA Knight, right? Like, LA Knight was not a name that he had on the indies. Like, that was not a thing that they had to change. That was WWE's property. They had LA Knight. That was their guy. Um, and... Yet they still brought him to the main roster with an entirely new reinvention. And I think it's kind of hard to see. You know, I, I, I still can't call the changes in NXT 2.0 like a complete success, right? Because I don't know. There hasn't been a full on call up of anybody who started in NXT 2.0, who is now on the main roster doing what they were doing in NXT 2.0 to then say that NXT 2.0 is a success. Uh, and with that I, I i don't believe that wwe sees any more value in what they're doing in nxt than what somebody was doing in the indies right i think somebody could very well just get called up and get rebranded and all of that uh regardless of if wwe owned the uh origination of it or not so i i it's hard for me to say you, you kind of hit the point here and, and by the way that's wwe's point what you're saying about how their NXT 2.0 star or NXT stars, right, of black and gold, they didn't come up and become tremendous stars. And it, like the homegrown guys, obviously Kevin Owens, he's he's a big star. Matt Riddle, he's a star. But as of right now, who's the guy that became the top guy in that in, on the main roster from NXT? You really. Uh uh you don't really have too many of those guys. And that that was how they look at it. And we can't count, you know, Roman Reigns and Moxley and Seth Rollins because they were FCW Because that was what was I was going to bring up with Seth Rollins. Yeah, well, well, those guys really, it was it was just, Seth was there for how long, you know, in NXT? It was before the Yeah, because he was there happened. mostly the, the FCW era. And then he was yeah. there because he was the first NXT champion. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, because, like, it's not to say the guys didn't get championship reigns, right? Because they called up Finn Balor. Yeah. He did get the reign, but then that was kind of it. Uh, so, it's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. A, I, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that when we get back from break. Andrew Zarian, Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here. Will Washington joining me. I tried to hit the post on that one. I couldn't do it, Will. I tried to hit the post Dang. on that pull-up. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say that's that's like my my skill of skills. I hitting the post if I can't get it, uh, I feel like I have failed for the day. But you know, I, I've I feel had the same. it since like day one. I was like California love. I could do. I could do California love. This one, I I, I was a little shaky. Hell in a cell tonight. Once again, I you know, I'm I'm seriously asking this question. I knew it was hell in a cell, right? I I, I should know. There are so many people that are tweeting me and saying. Wait a minute, there's a pay-per-view tonight? I'm I'm, there, I'm shocked. <laughs> actually, because this card uh, Well, the problem is uh there's one SmackDown match on it. And uh and for SmackDown for the last two and a half years being 
the the brand that more people watch like it's just a statistical fact um it is interesting that this pay-per-view like if you mostly follow smackdown uh you only got one match on this card you would think okay they're obviously not done building uh and meanwhile this is mostly a raw show Mm -hmm. uh there's uh, nothing else happening on this card and uh and then also it's just kind of in a weird period where there's no champion around and i feel like it's not that we haven't had a champion before but this is kind of unprecedented to not have any champion for either brand and i i I think one thing that championship matches help do is help sell you on the paper because you know the the program going into it and we don't have that here there there's only two championship matches on this card period at all well uh also look so, at how many people are off this card right yeah which is shocking so we got madcap moss and happy corbin in a no holds barred match uh, interest level for most people zero i'm gonna be on uh, listen i'm gonna be honest no no knock at the talent ever right i don't knock talent and perform but I mean, I don't think this is a combination of people really care to see anymore. Six-person mixed tag match. Judgment Day versus AJ, Finn, and Liv. You know what? I kind of want to see this. I like Liv being in that pseudo-bullet club with them. I, I, I think maybe this is a n- good chance for Liv, once again, to be in a, in a nice little program here. There's a fourth person maybe coming to Judgment Day. Maybe that person will show up. Curious that about could that. be exciting. I don't know. I I haven't really been feeling Judgment Day. Uh, I do like this combination of uh, AJ and Balor and and Liv Morgan, and I feel like it is really elevating Liv Morgan's stature, and that's always good. Uh, Judgment Day. I don't know. Something's not clicking for me, um, and I like them all as performers. But you think it's the sad about... goth makeup? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, or the promos, or like something is just not hitting for me yeah. with the Judgment Day. Yeah, they're just gonna and... start playing. Dude, they just sit down together. They play Depeche Mode, and they're done. Right? That's all yes. they do. <laughs> United States Champion Theory defends against Mustafa Ali. This John Cena Theory thing is that that's like happening in a sub feud online is interesting, and it kind of looks like they're doing something there. Uh, what do you think is going on here with Theory in the U.S. title? Uh, I mean, that could be the thing that. There's a lot of ways you can can push that, right? Because, like, arguably John Cena is considered, especially by WWE, to be the greatest United States champion of all time. So there's, like, a very built-in thing to do here with this, to have John Cena come in for, uh, come back for a title that's considered his and go for it against the guy who WWE has kind of pegged as the next John Cena in Austin Theory. All of it kind of works together at SummerSlam. But, of course... They've had guys that they thought were the future before to go up against John Cena at SummerSlam and didn't really work out all that well. Like I think about John Cena versus Baron Corbin. And it's not to say Baron Corbin's career didn't work out. But uh, at the time, it was like, okay, John Cena, Baron Corbin, one-on-one. This could be good. This could be good for Corbin. And like Corbin's got exactly where he was back then, and that was almost five years ago. Yeah. Uh, So it's kind of hard to tell. Um, I think Theory has the potential to be everything they want him to be. It's just a matter of can they commit to it. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see. Because the first time I saw Theory was in Evolve uh, 2000, right before the pandemic. And, you know, you saw him on the indies, and you're like, this kid's impressive. Good body, good, good, you know, in-ring is good. His promo was good. He had the look. Uh, and, and obviously Paul Heyman's a huge fan of his and kind of got him to come over there. But uh, And even in Evolve, they were talking about him as the next big guy. They yes, were they were, yeah. As the guy who has all that potential to be the next big star in WWE. Yeah. Uh, we got Kevin Owens versus Ezekiel. You know, I got to tell you, man, Ezekiel grew on me. I don't know if Ezekiel has grown on me <laughs> as much as... Kevin Owens' reaction to Ezekiel it could be that too. Is, is what's yeah. grown on me. I think Kevin Owens is the key to Ezekiel working right now because, like, on its own, just Ezekiel coming out and saying, I'm Elias' brother, that, you know, that's fine. But I feel like Kevin Owens' anger over it and him absolutely not believing it and wanting <laughs> nobody else to believe it is what I think has made this as entertaining as it's been. Yeah, I, Kevin Owens is tremendous in everything he does. Yes. We got a handicap match. Bobby Lashley versus Omos and MVP. I hope this feud is over. Uh, I, I, I genuinely hate that MVP and Bobby Lashley were split up. I genuinely hate that they split up that whole crew. 
I think it was a nice shine on guys like Shelton that, you know, they were they were in a main program and I very much enjoyed seeing him. I think Bobby Lashley is great, but I'm hoping that this is the end of this feud and maybe you can move Bobby Lashley into a main event picture because really it's lacking with the top guys, especially baby faces on that side. Cody's hurt too. So you got Cody, you know, Cody drew, uh, Orton riddle. Uh, did I say Cody again? Did I say drew yes. again? Uh, I think, <laughs> yeah. I think these guys are, you know, to, for a top level baby face positioning. I think that's great to put them in there. We got the raw women's champion. This and by the way, this is the match that got whacked out of place because of the uh, the situation with Naomi and Sasha, which we de we don't have an answer to here. They're indefinitely suspended. Still, I've heard nothing. Radio silence from everybody. Bianca Belair defends against Asuka and Becky Lynch in a triple threat match. This may be the match of the night. I think it. Uh... Before Cody's injury, I would have Before said Before Cody's so. injury, I, I, yeah. yeah. I would have said that the, the Hell in a Cell match was probably yeah. going to be, but um, these are three people who I absolutely trust to deliver. Uh, I think that we've seen what Becky and uh, and Bianca can do together. We saw their WrestleMania. Um, that was my personal match of the night. Uh, but then we've also seen what Asuka and Becky could do together, and we got a little glimpse of what Asuka and Bianca can. And so... I trust that as long as it's put together in a way that makes sense, uh, I think this match could deliver. My question is more for the aftermath and how, uh, who, who does Bianca move on to? Because it feels like Becky and Asuka aren't done with each other. That program feels like it's really just getting its legs under it. And that that's more what I'm interested in is what's next for Bianca. Yeah, me too. And we got the Hell in a Cell match, maybe, possibly, probably... Uh, Cody Rhodes versus Seth Rollins three. It was reported Cody had tore his pectoral muscle, and that is a not a fun injury. I I tore my pec. I've tore it, and it is extremely painful. Uh, I don't know how far of a tear it is, how big of a tear it is. Uh, we really don't have too much information on this. Dave reported that it, it's uh, possibly a pectoral muscle injury that he uh, he did in the gym while working out. What do you do here? If Cody is really banged up and hurt and let's say he needs some time off, do you, does Seth go over here? Uh, I imagine that's the only way to go, right? Uh, but more than that, what do you do without Cody? What do you do without <laughs> Cody? If, yeah. What, what happens without Cody? There's Raw is literally a show that has a countdown to Cody clock. That show has really put all of its eggs in the Cody basket. And th that would be devastating for that brand to not have Cody. It is well, devastating for the old WWE because Roman's yeah. not around. Yeah, Roman's not around. I, I, I'm going to get to this a little bit, and this kind of goes into, uh, actually, to be honest, WWE told me firsthand that the brand extension is still the brand extension, and there are going to be people that are specifically on the brand, but your top-level guys and, and women will be crossing over more. There's going to be more synergy between the brands, which makes a lot of sense to me. I, 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 I think... Like, I'm okay with a soft brand split if you have one title. You should have a soft brand split if you have one title. If you have two titles, it becomes a little bit more uh, the argument that goes the other way. But since they only have one title at this point, on the, the there's one tag title. Uh, there's one world title for the men's side. I think it's fine for you to go over. And the women's side, there's one tag title, too. So it, it's okay. I'm okay with them going over each side. Now, here's, here's my issue with this pay-per-view. Roman's not on it. Okay, fine, right? Roman's not on it. Riddle's not on it. Orton's not on it. Ronda's not out on it. That is a problem, isn't it? Yeah, and it's not like this is some kind of rinky dink arena or market. This is Chicago that they're yeah. in. Tonight. This is the All State Arena. This is uh, one of WWE's like top markets for running a bigger show in. And WrestleMania was in this arena. WrestleMania twenty two, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, and WrestleMania thirteen. Like they've done major shows in this venue, and uh, to think about the fact that you've got this market, you sold out this show uh in one of your biggest markets one of the biggest markets period and you you're not really giving them much of anything i would say it's the biggest market in pro wrestling right now chicago 
Uh, that would be very difficult to argue, yeah. Right? I, I mean, more than New York. I mean, New York's always been, like, a huge market. New York, Philly, Boston, Chicago. Uh, those are the those are the top four. But I would say Chicago's the number one market right now because no matter if it's WWE or AEW, they're doing unbelievable business there. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it is easy to get to for both coasts. It's an easier trip to get to. You know, it's two hours from New York. What is it? Three hours from L.A., from the West Coast. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Around there. Uh, so it's an easier destination to go to. But I don't think a Hell in a Cell pay-per-view is a destination pay-per-view. You know, it, what, w, it, what AEW is doing, AEW has done a great job at convincing people that every pay-per-view should be a destination because it's four times a year or five times a year. For WWE's sake, they're running, what, 16, 17 PLEs, premium live events for those who don't know. I, I hate I'm that glad term. That nomenclature has stuck with you, though. The it fact has. That you said it is PLE. You, you, know, didn't, you I, didn't even hesitate. You know, I got to tell you, I'm so used to corporate lingo that I deal with on a daily basis. And when I saw that come up on a uh, on an email from WWE to me, I'm like, oh, I love that this is their new corporate lingo. It's not a pay per view anymore. It's a PLE. And then now everybody's calling it PLEs. By the way, the whole industry is calling them PLEs. I still like pay per view, but I, I'm going to do it to annoy people. It's a PLE. Uh, <laughs> it's a PLE, okay. You know, 16 shows, and now you're in a market, a top market. You you're you're trying everything to sway the perception of your brand from being this stale product. Which, by the way, there's a lot of people that don't feel that way. I, I'm one of these people that does feel that way, and I'm very honest about how I feel about professional wrestling. When something, when I'm in a slump. With the product, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna slump with the product. WWE, I'm in a total slump with the product right now. I, I I don't get that excitement as as much as I used to. I I haven't got I did even WrestleMania, man. I, I was was it great? Yeah, it was a really good WrestleMania. I enjoyed everything. Boat boat nights. I enjoyed everything about it. But right now, they have conditioned me to not care about these matches. And I, like Cody, Seth, in a cage in in a cell. That's a great match. And I care about those two, and I want to see them wrestle. I just, eh. Everything is eh, because it's so... I'm so desensitized to their booking where I don't expect anything huge to happen. And that's a problem. That's a, that's a problem for me, that's a problem for you, and that's a problem for the viewers, especially ones that are watching the PLE. Wrestling Observer Live, we're going to be back right after this. Joined by Will Washington, one of my favorite guests on the show. We'll be right back. Wrestling Observer Live, final few minutes of the show. Andrew Zarian here. Hey, listen, I never plug my stuff. You can follow me at Andrew Zarian on Twitter. I drop some scoops every now and then. You can follow Will Washington on Twitter. Where can people follow you? What's your What's your handle? Yeah, you can follow me. I am, uh, you see it on the screen, uh, at William RBR. If you don't have a screen, then I am at William RBR. Um, and you can also find me. I host Grap City every Saturday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. That is at youtube.com slash Fightful. Uh, and then I also host Day After Dynamite as well. Uh, there's also a show I'm going to be hosting starting tomorrow, but I don't believe that's announced yet, so I'm going to save that one. But that one's actually kind of big as well. I like that uh, we've created this uh, very nice group of pro wrestling media personalities and journalists that all get along. We all yeah, chill, I love we that. all hang out. Like I think it's I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's awesome that you come on here, Sean comes on here, I have Dave on here, Garrett comes on. Like it's a nice little bridge between all of us. Cause listen, we're at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're talking about professional wrestling. It's something that we've all loved since we were kids. It's it, it's not something that, you know, you get into uh for the money later on in life and say, you know what, I'm gonna start covering professional wrestling. It, it's not it doesn't work that way. You kind of have to this has to be engraved in you uh from childhood. I'm scarred from it. I would have had a whole different path. I told Dave in, I told Dave in, I told Dave in Vegas. I looked at, I go, Dave, you know, you ruined my life with this. I was Iata radio. I would turn it on. I found that show and it, I got hooked even more than I've ever been with professional wrestling. I grew up, you know, my father was a bodybuilder. My grandfather was a bodybuilder. So I grew up with like wrestling being in my life, but that show 20 some odd years ago really set the trajectory of my life. Uh, in this direction so listen everybody loves it and we're out of time here wrestling observer live we're going to be back next week with another great guest will washington money uh helena sells tonight so uh watch it tweet me and uh, let me know what you think we'll be all back next week take care everybody <laughs>